The Tom Woods Show, episode 865. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you like this show, I guarantee you will enjoy my brand new free ebook, Sane Space, Libertarian Dispatches from Bizarro America. Grab your copy at sanespacebook.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I'm going to critique an article today. I haven't done this in a while. I don't know why. I like critiquing articles. Somebody sent me this article the other day, and I looked at it, and I wrote back to him, and I said, it looks like nobody has read this article. It looks like it has an audience of zero, so maybe I would be doing the author a favor by critiquing it. But then I thought, I think that's kind of a juvenile way of looking at things. Uh, so what if, if somebody who says the wrong thing gets a few extra clicks? The important thing is talking about ideas. And it may not be that this guy's article is such great shakes, but in the course of answering it, you get to talk about some important stuff and teach some important stuff and make some good points. And that's really what matters. Who cares if the guy gets a few extra clicks? And he doesn't seem, by the way, like a terrible person. He's not a social justice warrior, from what I can tell. He's not calling libertarians Nazis or any ridiculous stuff like that. So I appreciate those things. So I'm going to give this a, a fair shake here. This is an article called Taxation is Not Theft and the Fallacy of Voluntaryism. And I'm obviously, you know, I'm going to link to the article on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 865. What the author, whose name is Andy Zoe, is trying to do in this article is should be obvious from the title. He's going to try to refute this standard libertarian claim about taxation being theft, and he's referring to voluntarism, which is a term that's sometimes used by, I find in general, by people who just don't like the somewhat clunky term anarcho-capitalism. It's just the idea that a uh, transaction, an exchange, should not take place unless both parties consent to it, so that in other words, all human interaction should be voluntary. So that, that basically is libertarianism. The article, which was written just a few days ago, as I record this, begins with a familiar argument. It says that the libertarian or the voluntarist is uh, making a pretty weak argument when claiming that taxes are wrong, they're, they're theft. He says this is, this is a weak argument because we can answer this with social contract theory. I think I've hit social contract theory at least once before, so I'll try and remember to link to that previous episode. But by and large, the way he's describing it is as follows. In our society, we've agreed to exchange taxes for government. Where comes the assumption that one owes nothing? Well, I guess it has a little something to do with what we mean by we. When exactly did this occur? And it's sometimes thought that it's petty of libertarians to demand to know precisely when the social contract was signed. If you're going to claim that as a society we came together and made an agreement whereby we were going to be governed by certain rules and we all understood that taxation would be involved and being subject to the jurisdiction of this institution we're creating would be involved, libertarians are, are, are sometimes dismissed for being petty and silly for demanding to know when exactly that occurred. But that's not a silly objection at all because contracts derive their moral force precisely from consent. As David Friedman puts it, the social contract, so-called, has the form, I will give you these services and you will pay me for them whether you agree to or not. And that's really what's going on here. Even if I use these services, what alternative did I have? I don't – I've been placed in this impossible situation – very much against my will, what else am I supposed to do? I have no other way of indicating my lack of consent. And moreover, if we're going to argue that tacit consent exists or – or because you know, that's the argument of the social contracts, that you've at least tacitly consented to it. Yes, it's true. You didn't take out a quill pen and some ink and sign your name on anything. We'll grant you that. But you did tacitly consent to the social contract. You tacitly consented to the legitimacy of the regime ruling over you when you failed to leave, when you did not leave where you're currently living. And then, you know, therefore, 
you know, leave to go to some other government. You didn't leave, so we take that to mean you have consented to be ruled. But is that a fair interpretation of what I'm doing? Couldn't it be instead that I've simply decided that the current government I live under is the least oppressive one that I can reasonably find? Not that I actively assent to its rule and I agree to the various uh, rules that have been established by this alleged social contract, but rather, rather simply, I can't find a better one, and so I'm going to live here. For example, would it be fair to say I'm observing this person being robbed? Let's say a mugger is robbing somebody, and the person being robbed hands over his wallet. Would I therefore have the right to say, well, he consented to that exchange, or he accepts the legitimacy of what the robber is doing because, after all, he did hand over his wallet? Well, of course, what was really happening there is that the person was concluding that handing over the wallet and preserving his life was better than dying. Why don't we simply accept it at that minimalist level instead of adding on all these additional layers of interpretation of what the person must be saying when he hands over his wallet or when he pays taxes? Instead of saying, well, you must therefore be assenting to the social contract, why not keep things simple with, as with Occam's razor, the, the, the simplest explanation, all things equal is to be preferred. How about simply, without having to guess what's going on in my brain, how about simply I prefer handing over the wallet to getting killed or I prefer handing over the taxes to getting thrown in, in jail? That way you don't really have to read my mind. You can sort of assume this based on the actions you see me taking. But the idea that in my mind I'm saying, well, you are my legitimate ruler, O oh mugger, or you are my legitimate ruler, O oh government, that's a leap. How are you justified in making that leap? You have to read the guy's mind. I think explanations that don't involve mind reading are to be preferred. Also, if we're going to put all this emphasis on tacit consent, that means that the person arguing for it does believe that some form of consent you know, has to be acquired or is meaningful. Consent is a meaningful concept when looking at the individual in society. It's simply that their threshold for what constitutes consent is much lower than mine. Their view is as long as you're hanging around here, that means you've consented. But the point is they raised the idea of consent. They believe that consent has some moral force and plays some role in determining something morally significant. Well, what if I walk around and instead of just walking around and letting them assume that my mere presence means I've consented to the whole system, what if I walk around shouting, I don't consent to this system. Nobody ever asked my consent. I do not give it. I have never given it. I can't withdraw it because I never gave it in the first place, but I absolutely refuse to go along with this system, which I never consented to and do not believe in. Suppose I explicitly said that. Given that the people advocating social contract and tacit consent, by the very act of raising the concept of tacit consent, are admitting that consent has moral force, why would my explicit lack of consent, my explicit refusal to consent, not override the obviously convoluted tacit consent that they have to get by reading my mind and trying to guess through context clues what I really mean? What if the words coming out of my mouth are really a better indication of what I really mean? What if the actual sentiments I'm expressing are probably a better gauge of what I'm thinking? Shouldn't that override the alleged tacit consent? Why wouldn't my explicit non-consent override the much more difficult to, to ascertain tacit consent? Also, if there is no obvious way for me not to consent, and simply saying I could move away would mean I didn't consent, but where would I go? I'd, have, I'd go somewhere else where you would then say I've consented to that. So there really is no way for me to withdraw my consent. So the whole thing is meaningless from the start. If you're not ever going to give me any possible way of dissenting, then it's not legitimate to talk about my assent. Because I, according to you, had no choice in the matter. 
There is no, there is nothing I could have done that would cause these people to say, well, this guy really didn't consent other than moving away. But then as soon as I move away, they'll say I consented to something else. They'll, I consented to that government. They don't give me an option of not consenting. So the whole thing seems like a farce to me. Let me read a little bit also from, from David Friedman who says the standard response is that you implicitly agree by remaining in the country. But this works and he's, what he's going to show is this is a circular argument. This works only if the government already has the right to throw you out of the country. That is, if the government is somehow the owner of the entire territory it rules. Without a social contract, it's hard to see how you can justify such a claim. And until you can justify it, you can't get your social contract in the first place. Then he goes on, he's, he's referring to a critic named Mike. He says, I could, after all, propose a contract to Mike under which he agrees to pay me $1,000 a month in exchange for the valuable services I, I'm providing by critiquing his article. I could also inform him that by breathing, he agrees to accept that contract. But unless he already believes that he has no right to breathe without my permission, it, it's hard to see why he should feel obligated to pay. So you see, again, this is a circular argument. If I were to say, well, you breathed, therefore you agreed to accept my contract, that takes for granted that he has no right to breathe without my permission. But that's precisely the point being argued. So, so much of the social contract argument simply assumes that it's true and then gets angry at people who don't go along with it, don't accept it, try to live as if it doesn't exist. They assume that it's true. They assume that the government has all the powers that a social contract, if it could exist, would have given it. But the whole question is, we don't accept that there is such a thing. So you can't just argue. It's, it's like arguing to me, um, God exists because I read it in the Bible. Well, you can make arguments for the existence of God. I've even done that on the show. But that's a circular argument. Then the article goes on to say that the fatal flaw of voluntarism is that truly voluntary consent cannot even exist. He says it'll always be tainted by past events. Uh, so he says whether it is due to the invisible hand, institutionalized bigotry, or even the weather, every step of our lives is determined not solely by free will, but also by the machinations of the various systems which surround us. Well, whatever that's supposed to mean, it doesn't matter what the weather is. Uh, if the weather is rainy and, and some bad things happen to me, it doesn't follow from that that I therefore have the right to commit aggression against other people. That's really what it boils down to. Do you have the right to initiate violence against somebody? The invisible hand metaphor is not helpful here because the invisible hand is simply the collective decisions or not you, you know what I mean the, the the decisions of all the people in society to buy, to sell, to abstain from buying, to abstain from selling. Yeah, of course that's going to – everybody's going to be affected by the actions of other people. No kidding. Why would that be debatable? But to say that my life is necessarily affected by the events that take place around me, therefore voluntary consent cannot exist, that does not follow. That, that, that's just an extremely bad argument. Those, that does not follow because there are circumstances, therefore there's no voluntary consent. Because I can't have the world be the way I might prefer it does not mean I can't make real choices now. He even says, can there be any truly voluntary action for any descendant of those abducted from Africa? Whoa. So you're saying that black Americans today, not one of their actions is truly voluntary. Not one. Nothing. No choice they make is truly voluntary. They're constrained by past events. It's true. They are in circumstances that are different from what they would have been if they'd been kept in Africa. That's true. They're in a different country, different culture, different society. That's true. But does it mean then that when they choose a ham sandwich over a turkey one, that's not a voluntary choice? The mere fact that our choices and our situations in life are affected by the lives of our parents, our grandparents, our, uh, these circumstances, this doesn't mean that the choices we make today aren't real choices. And much more importantly, and this is the whole point of voluntarism, it does not mean that I have the right to commit violence against somebody. Because the people who are alive today did not commit aggression against me, so I don't have the right to commit aggression against them. How does any of this 
the whole the whole article is an attempt to, to dance away from the central claim of voluntarism, which is you don't have the right to use violence on peaceful people. Period. You do not have the right to do that. So how do I get? The, is he saying I get a right to do that if I was abducted from Africa, or let's say my ancestors? Yeah, any descendant of those abducted from Africa. Now, if you were abducted from Africa, you're darn right you could um, fight to to free yourself, and that wouldn't even be aggression. The aggression would be the grabbing you in the first place. But talking about, let's say, 400 years later, do you have the right to go up to the average guy on Main Street and take his money because of what happened with your ancestors? No, because he didn't do anything to you. That guy did not do anything to you. Now, if we can actually track down and trace out that somebody inherited property from his grandfather and his grandfather oppressed your grandfather— and we can trace all this out, then I think you can make a libertarian case for taking the property from the one and giving it back to the other. So it's, I don't think it's correct to insinuate that libertarianism simply has nothing to say about this kind of issue. He then goes on to say, oppressed peoples have long known that their place in society is due to past forces beyond their present set of voluntary choices and personal responsibilities, so they legitimately resist ideologies that would hold them accountable for those forces. All right, I think here we're just dealing with the fact that he's not a very good writer. He, he thinks using, using flowery language makes him a good writer. Nobody is saying that an oppressed people is accountable for the forces that oppress them. So accountable is definitely not the word he's looking for there. But in terms of oppressed peoples, almost all oppressed peoples are oppressed by the state, aren't they? I mean, it's true, of course, you can think of private examples of oppression. But by and large, when you think of oppressed peoples, peoples who have been enslaved or otherwise mistreated on a large scale, it's almost always due to the state. And so if you'd had voluntarism, you wouldn't have the oppression in the first place. Then we get toward the end and we read and again I, I mean the the I think this is the case I went through this when I was younger too. I thought I was a great writer, I thought I was really eloquent, but actually I my writing was convoluted, was wordy, not concise, uh, needed a uh, some kind of a I would say a scalpel, but no, nah, it needed more of a meat axe taken to it. So you definitely see that in this prose. He says in recognizing that an individual cannot move society's terms, yet a collective can, we realize intuitively that the authority of a state or government must derive from a measurement of society's collective consent. And he italicizes the words society's collective consent. This falls in line with ethical subjectivism. Right and wrong is largely determined by societal opinion. The authority of a social contract may then even be considered proportional to the consent granted by its constituents. That's an interesting thing to say, given that its constituents are all presumed to have consented to it by virtue of the fact that they live there. So I don't see how you could have anything that's proportional. You haven't at in any time asked people about their consent, the degree of their consent, the very existence of their consent. You've assumed it. So how can you do anything that's proportional? It doesn't even make sense. You have to, according to him, we assume every single person has consented because they live here. So he says, it is not the explicitness of consent that is relevant. It is how that consent compares to the will of the collective. Well, this begs every imaginable question. Who determines the will of the collective? Is it through a vote of some kind? And who says that that vote is legitimate? Why the social contract says it's legitimate. Yeah, I got that. But when people say I'm, I haven't consented to this social contract, so you're going to have to, you have to find this. You have to reach this opinion on some other basis. You can't just say, well, the social contract, the social contract. Our argument is, without the social contract, you can't then go and say that assessing the will of the collective is legitimate. But then he says, so it is not the explicitness of consent that is relevant. It is how that consent compares to the will of the collective. Well, this just begs every question in the world, right? Who has the ability to, uh, to assess the will of the collective? I mean, this is a guy who basically assumes everybody has consented because they're standing around living somewhere. 
Uh, I have a feeling that his interpretation of the will of the collective is going to be fairly sledgehammerish and not particularly subtle. And of course, there is no will of the collective. There are only individual wills. Moreover, according to this argument that the will of the will of the collective is what matters, then this immediately justifies slavery in all the societies where it has existed. Because by and large, the will of the collective was that we should have slavery. So this is the problem with ethical subjectivism. Right and wrong is largely determined by societal opinion. Well, uh, a lot of times people in society are dirty bums who have terrible moral ideas, and now you have to be hostage to those because of your ethical subjectivism, so-called. So it's, it seems like a very confused series of, of arguments. He says, uh, don't get me wrong, I sympathize with anarchists and agree the state is certainly not without its sins. That's generous. I simply contend that voluntarism is a flawed angle from which to address the failings of a state. He says, I firmly believe in Thoreau's opening from civil disobedience, that government is best which governs least, but far too many take this line to heart without remembering his caveat of when men are prepared for it. So again, Andy Zo will help figure out when we're prepared to have uh, less government. So while it is a noble desire, he goes on, to reduce government, one must consider who benefits and who suffers from that reduction. Okay, but that's just an arbitrary moral statement that has nothing to do with the rest of his article. One must consider who benefits and who suffers from that reduction? Okay, well, but why should I accept that? Uh, he just got done saying that um, he believed in ethical subjectivism. Why should I? So maybe I could just say to him, well, that may be true for you, but that principle is not true for me, and then we're just at a, 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 an impasse. So one must consider who benefits and who suffers from that reduction. So people who benefit are the people who have been exploited, expropriated, tortured, caged for victimless crimes. All those people would benefit from reducing government. Who would suffer from that reduction? Well, people who are trying to live at the expense of other people, people who are trying to lord it over other people. Uh, yeah, okay. Thanks, Andy Zoe. I've just considered who benefits and who suffers, and that makes me all the more committed to reducing or eliminating government. And then he says, this is the last sentence, if one must reduce taxes, do it for the sake of reducing taxes and not under the false premise that taxes are inherently immoral. And if one must abolish the state, do so because there exists a better alternative. So I guess what he means there is that you can't oppose the state on moral grounds because the state is already justified. The state has already been justified by the will of the collective. So you can't come up to it and have a moral objection because we've already decided that it's legitimate. We've already decided among ourselves this is how we'd like to, uh, to arrange our society. And he says, do so because there exists a better alternative. All right, well, I'll do it on those grounds too. If that'll make them happier, I'll have both moral and practical grounds for being a libertarian. So there you have it. All right, that's going to do it for today. If you've been enjoying the show, consider becoming a supporting listener and joining the elite over at supportinglisteners.com, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.